Stephen, I uh, was in Nuremberg two years ago with a group of uh, practitioners in international criminal justice, and you spoke to us over the uh, VTC. Yes. And I have to say, when I, when I heard you speak, um, I thought you were nuts. I really did. I thought it flies in the face of everything we had been experiencing in the last 40 years around the world, uh, and we still see many dreadful acts of violence from the families being boiled alive in the Eastern Congo to the atrocities now being committed in Syria. And I wondered whether your outlook was too Western-centric, and I wondered what your sources uh, could have been to present this uh, material the way you did. Now, I'm reading your book, and I have to say it's brilliant. And I think uh, you have done justice to the theory by providing a cogency and a lucidity to the arguments, which, uh, which are uh, really wonderful, a wonderful testament to your scholarship. However, there is a, a concern, and that is a sort of unanticipated consequence, perhaps, if you will. If you run the argument that the, there is a trend that has been in place for the last five, uh, let's say, centuries or so, maybe even going back further, uh, in one way, the potential consequence of this is to tranquilize the sense of urgency over how much we still need to do. I mean, we still need to exert a great deal of effort to ensure that we don't have female infanticide in many parts of the world, to ensure that we don't have breast flattening or FGM or all these rather uh, sort of terrible phenomena. And my worry is, is that you take a bit of the sting out of this by presenting it as an inexorable sort of curve, if you will, or a, 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 a development in human history. And in one way, whether we do something or not, it's going to lead to some sort of uh, end to violence in 50 to 60 years or a curbing of it. And isn't there a danger of this? Uh, in the same way, for instance, that uh, uh, social anthropologists, uh, when they first started to do work on the former Yugoslavia in the 1970s, did not anticipate that classification of peoples would then filter into political programs and lead to mass violence and the wars and, and genocide that we saw in the former Yugoslavia. So, so is there not a danger here? Yeah. Uh, well, it's an empirical question, and I suspect that it's the other way around, that if people are convinced that uh, nothing can be done because of either human nature or benighted parts of the world where they'll just kill each other because of ancient hatreds, uh, then that can lead to a, a paralysis based on uh, hopelessness, intractability, cynicism. And uh, I think it would be interesting to do the study to give people two sets of hypothetical results and see which one mobilizes them more. Uh, I would not be surprised if it's uh, knowing that rates of violence can come down, something that we have done in the past seems to have worked, would mobilize them uh, more than it doesn't matter what you do, the rates are constant. That having been said, uh, for one thing, it's, uh, it, uh, what is true is true. So even if it were the case that it would have the, um, uh, the uh, effects we wouldn't like, uh, I don't think that means we should fool ourselves or mislead people or, or lie because one possible uh, way of reporting the, the truth is uh, uh, leads to effects we don't like. There is a value in just knowing the accurate state, accurately the state of the world. The other uh, reason that I think that it's, it's important to document these declines when they occur is to then go back and see what works and what doesn't work. Uh, because a lot of hypotheses about what ought to reduce violence uh, as, uh, as uh, Jens said, turn out to be false. It's not you know, moral poverty, it's not physical, po uh, um, material poverty. Uh, by taking an evidence-based approach, we can look back and see if some of our moralistic ideas that make us feel good uh, by implementing them do or don't have the effect that we actually want. And, and in the book, I spend a fair amount of time on what are plausible uh, causes of the decline. Does uh, peacekeeping work, the United Nations and other forces? Um, based on recalling single incidents, you could push the argument either way because everyone can recall cases where peacekeeping did not work. Everyone can recall conflicts that fizzled out on their own. But when you do the large end study and you, you uh, aggregate all the cases, 
uh, you discover that peacekeeping has a massive uh, positive beneficial uh, effect. Likewise, do reconciliation gestures after a conflict prevent it from reigniting? A priori, who knows? It might just be meaningless, touchy-feely gestures. The data suggests that uh, holding all else constant, they really do tend to work. Whereas some other things, uh, uh, interventions uh, uh, don't work. So taking an evidence-based empirical approach, I think, is the, uh, for many reasons, is the, the right way to think about violence. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Ahmed Jalal. I'm, I work at Abraj Capital. Slightly fishing here and seeing what you have talked about um, development. Uh, it applies to an example from politics. And by politics, I mean uh, the contract for America, the Republican Revolution, and the, and the way it was packaged. Um, the psychology of that was, you know, there's something called um, a, f um, a benevolent father, the father who's a protector. And, and, and for you to be moral, you have to be disciplined. And for you to be disciplined, you need to do the right things. And that basically means if you're disciplined, you're going to be prosperous. If you're not disciplined, you are going to be um, uh, a burden on the state. So in a sense, they collapse morality with discipline and discipline with prosperity. And so in a way, the whole Republican revolution was based on the fact that the, you know, the state uh, if you are not dis if you're not prosperous, then you should not be you know uh, you're not you should not be uh, pro uh, protected by the state. So in a in a sense, they got people to vote against their own self-interest because they linked morality um, and to be moral is to be uh, against their own self-interest. So I wanted to see if that kind of ties in with with the theory that you have talked about or um, and, and an application from politics. Who's I, I'll, I can answer just quickly that I have an article in today's New York Times on that topic. So I'll just refer you to that, that, uh, that article in, in the stone. OK. So question about um, <clears throat> becoming a man experiment. Um, it wasn't clear to me, but maybe I missed something, that you have shown or demonstrated that poverty or moral poverty um, are not increasing uh, crime because maybe they simply make it more likely that people act without thinking. Now, you may have, you have found a solution that makes people be able to reverse that, um, but at the cause, I don't think you've really shown. And secondly, you say the benefits, uh, uh, cost benefits are somewhere between one and two and one and 30, and in terms of dollars, and just that's a huge range, and obviously you have a huge impact on policy as to you know one to two, you might find many other things that work better, one to 30, it's not likely. Um, and why is such a huge range with your randomized trials and uh, that kind of uncertainty is not that useful? Yeah, sure. That's a great, uh, great question. Um, I, uh, I, I, might have, I do not want to convey the sense that material poverty and moral poverty are not important. Um, it's certainly the case that crime is so disproportionately overrepresented over in low-income countries and within a country among low-income low segments of the population, that it's very plausible that that plays, uh, plays a big independent role. I think the thing that we've become um, stuck on in many places is uh, we've um, believed that material poverty is an important driver of the crime and violence problem, and it is so difficult to change. If you look at the poverty rate in the United States over the last 30 or 40 years, it, it basically has not changed much at all. And so if you think that the only way that you can change crime and violence is by changing the amount of poverty that we have, it's very easy to then get into a mindset that says, if, we, if the poverty rate is pegged at 15% forever, and we're worried about the crime problem, just lock them up. And so I wouldn't want to say that it doesn't matter, but it is not the only thing that matters. And leaving those important social conditions unchanged, even leaving those things unchanged, we can really move the needle a lot. The, uh, the reason that the benefit-cost ratio has changed so much is um, there is a, uh, a small number. The, you know, these kids are 13 to 17 uh, on the south side and west side of Chicago. These are school kids. And even among the school kid population, there are some kids, unfortunately, in the control group who commit homicides that you don't see among kids in the treatment group. And the re reason for the range of the estimates is that it is extremely controversial. To, the social cost of homicide is just off the uh, charts compared to every other crime type. And it gets into questions about how you, what dollar value you put 
on a, on a life, or a statistical life is the way economists think about it. And whether you should use the same sort of value of statistical life for you know, uh, a 40-year-old economics professor or a 16-year-old kid who might spend a bunch of their time after school selling drugs on the street corner that is voluntarily engaging in a, and the sensitivity there reflects some attempt to be uh, um, aware of the fact that there is a, a <coughs> debate about that. Uh, it, you know, the, the school. The thing that I didn't mention is this, the school engagement uh, impacts forecast out to increase graduation rates of 10 to 20 percent. Uh, the kids are a little bit too old to have reached 12th grade. This is uh, set against the backdrop where the graduation rate in the United States has basically been perfectly flat for 30 or 40 years. Um, we're going to follow these kids out over time with administrative data. I feel very, very confident in saying if those graduation rates are realized, this is going to be one of the biggest wins from a benefit cost perspective that I have ever seen. Uh, thanks for this uh, fascinating presentation. Um, please accept my ignorance um, on, on those topics. and. I would like to ask a question um, that is the following. Is it also about a, the loss perception um, of an action, i.e., if you consider that a decision you are making will produce a big loss, you tend to think twice on um, making it? And take the example of uh, the alarm. Uh, losing five minutes, maybe you, you consider it one day as you know, a very minimal loss, or the second day if you need to catch an airplane or you have an important meeting, then your engine mechanism will act um, faster on you. And therefore, the loss perception, and go back to the teenager, uh, maybe their perception of you know, loss is minimal um, when they take an action, and therefore, they tend to risk or not to consider the consequences um, compared to those who are maybe have more to lose socially, economically, or in terms of reputation, or they have things that are at stake more important whenever they make these kind of decisions. Is this issue a relevant issue? I mean, I think one of the things that's, that's interesting in what you're saying uh, but um, doesn't end up being as true is that you tend, to, you tend to think that somehow when the stakes are very big or when something matters more, you might behave less automatically. But in fact, those two, while somewhat related, are, not, are, are far from perfectly related. In fact, take the case of losses that you're describing. If you feel like you're about to lose something, that might actually create an incredibly strong response, which might actually be an even more powerful automatic response. Um, so in that sense, that's, it, it's not immediately obvious that losses or any other things that sort of raise the stakes or raise your engagement in the problem um, actually help. So in the CBT stuff Jens was talking about, one of the things that you try and do with stop, look, listen is to disengage. So it's actually to encourage you to step back from the situation. And things like a large loss and so on actually make it harder to disengage. And so in fact, what's the whole automaticity aspect of it is as much about not caring, about distancing, as it is about uh, the stakes being high. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, what does the res so, sorry, thank you. What does the research show about other non-material factors, like for example, um, belonging or n the sense of belonging, you know, I am someone versus I'm nobody in this community, which is maybe the same thing as saying um, I belong to a community or I don't belong to a community. Um, the other one potentially uh, would be social values or religious values in that given community. So for example, some countries which have very low per capita income have a very low crime rate and others with a slightly higher per capita income have a very high crime rate. Certainly, as you were saying before, income cannot be the main factor. But the question is, what are the factors? Um, 
Another one could be, and it's always a question, um, am I active or not, regardless of income? So somebody who is active doing something, there's a presumption that the person is less likely to be engaged in criminal activities, but it's only a presumption. So what, you know, I, I don't think we heard a lot about factors in addition to a technique that you are effectively using to fight criminality, which uh, is important. One more question here, and then we'll quickly answer and then stop, because I think we're out of time. I think I'm just trying to be more explicit, because I think I wanted to ask the same thing he, he just alluding to. I just want to know what the issue of drugs abuse, poverty, and race profiling have to do with the deviation or the study you do, because I don't know whether you do the studies on normal human beings with, uh, I don't know which background, because th these to me are main drivers of, uh, of crime and maybe they require different understanding and, uh, and acknowledgement. And do you punish or do you use corrective met methods to, to deal with them? Thank you. So um, the, I, I focused, th there are a bunch of things that, uh, that drive the crime and violence problem that are extremely difficult to change. And the thing that I'm most interested in myself is focusing on those areas where we can actually make a difference and move the needle. Um, let me tell you what the strongest correlate by far, there's uh, the strongest predictor of your risk of crime and violence involvement in the United States, I'm sure this is true for most countries, is gender. Far and away, right? If we got rid of all the men, we would have basically we would we would have no more crime and violence problem, right? <laughs> That's not actually so helpful. From I have I have uh, uh, two daughters. I'm perfectly I would be perfectly happy to get rid of all the men, but that's not actually something that's very useful from a from a policy uh, from a policy perspective. Um, sense of belonging, things like that, surely must be really important. But I don't know what to do with that, right? Um, Interesting. Yeah, we've we've seen that in the United States context too, where the um, the uh, some of the police thought in in the attempt to be helpful had really tried to crack down on the gangs and make the gang members' lives difficult, and we've discovered that that winds up increasing the sense of cohesion within the gang and actually makes the the gang problem uh, uh, worse rather than rather than better. And so there are a bunch of things that are important contributors that we either can't change or we don't understand well enough where if we try and change it, we might actually make things worse. Right, and let me give one last thought to that, and then we should need to wrap up. I think that there's this view of values as being in this vertical scale. But I think across all of these talks, I hope one thing you've taken away is that values are neither good nor bad. So for example, in Jens's story, the value, I'm going to protect my friends. Is that a good value or a bad value? If it leads you to shoot some guy in the chest, it's a bad value. If it leads you to give to them during times of crisis, it's a good value. And a lot of these values that have these strong <coughs> behaviors, I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying, I'm just as a reminder that the values can, be, can look very good. A communal value in Josh's thing, where we all look out after each other, that can be a very good value. But that same value becomes an act to violence and genocide when it becomes us versus them. So that, that notion of values, I think it's a good reminder to keep in mind that they are not vertical and they're not better and worse values. So, okay, thank you all. And, thank you. Thank you.